I know it's just a spot on the calendar, and I know it's really this something that we have created to keep track of where we are in all of this. And yet I absolutely love this opportunity for renewal, for assessment and renewal, for reflection and renewal that is happening right now. And I think that that's what I attribute most of my enthusiasm to. So we are, of course, talking about something that I have termed Power and Light Incorporated. And this is a concept that really bubbled up in me about five years ago. Ish. No, I guess it was 2012. February 2012. Not quite that long. And it occurred to me, and of course you know how we tap into the infinite and we think we're having an original thought and actually it's not. But I had my own experience of recognizing that when we discover what empowers us, when we discover what lights us up, when we discover what our gifts, our talents are, and give ourselves permission to follow those Great things happen not only on the inside and not only in our own lives and our own experiences, but they happen for everyone else too. Has any one of you been to a guidance counselor in high school or college? Okay. Well, my experience was that I was guided by the one in high school to go to college. Yay, thumbs up. I was guided by the one in college to select from those markets of the, of the highest degree of employment at the time, they were called marketable skills. And we think one of these two would be best for you. No personality testing, no interview, no investigation into who I am and what my gifts and talents are. And so one of them I think was computer programming, and if you know me, that would have been a really bad choice. <laughs> the other one was hospitality or hotel or restaurant management. Well, I kind of accidentally, you know, naturally fell into that. And yet what I really longed for was something different. And I was beginning to get these urges and these... Uh, uh, Mary Morrissey says to pay attention to your areas of longing and discontent. And she actually celebrates those because they offer us direction. So I had these areas of longing and, yes, some of discontent. And I had things that really mattered to me. And I was so young, I didn't even know how to identify them. I didn't have the tools to cope with them. And I didn't have the vocabulary to really articulate what they were until later. But what was happening was an evolution. It was an evolution throughout my experience that I'm sure that you have experienced as well, where the things that really mattered to me kept coming up. Sometimes, or perhaps even often, in the experience of contrast with how I was living. So there was this contrast between what was welling up in me that, that mattered, that had meaning and purpose, and around which I felt enthusiasm and passion. And then there was the rest of the world. So I don't know if we have this in common, but my journey was to, to, to close that gap between what was, what was so new and, and undeveloped and, and raw inside of me and what was happening out there. And negotiating that contrast now, in the early days, you know, and, and in several phases in, 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 our, in our lives together, we might be referred to as idealists, as if there was something wrong with that. I remember being called a free spirit in high school, and it was intended as an insult. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> so, there are, there's a little bit of a cultural suggestion that if we lean in the direction of what empowers us, what lights us up, if we move in the direction of our ideals, if we take the time to discover what has meaning and value to us, we're being frivolous. We are perhaps indulging in something that there isn't time for, right? And we are ignoring all of those important things out there. The beauty of time 
and experience on the planet, however, is that we begin to realize that perhaps those early and innocent, uh, unarticulated longings that we had when we were younger were right. So if you want to take a moment and pat yourself on the back and say, I was right, this might be the time. Because there is a voice within each of us that is right. It always has been. It is now and ever will be so. Now, when you're still living under your parents' roof, you might have to keep that to yourself. I journaled since I was nine years old. I started taking notes about life so early on because my perception of what was going on out there and what I was experiencing in here, they were so different. I just had to tell somebody, so I told my journal. <laughs> I used to carry around a little notebook like my father, little, tiny, one of those little, you know, they're like a dollar now, and you flip them and write in them and stick them in your pocket. And I just kept writing. I just kept writing. So what I know now, because, because it's been a while since I was nine years old, since it's been a while on this road of, of discovery, of inquiry, of wondering, of trying to make sense of it all, and ignoring those people who said, don't do that. Don't try to understand. Just give it up. I just gave them up. Right? <laughs> what I realized is that, of course, we start by recognizing that everybody is always doing the best they can with what they've got, right? And so people who did their best to guide us could only do that with what they knew. So what I have discovered over the years is that I have embraced more and more of what empowers me, what lights me up. I have recognized that it's built in, incorporated, and I have recognized that to the degree, those are Ernest Holmes' words, but if this is my, my use of them, to the degree that I embrace those things, those gifts and talents that I have, and make them important, make them central, make them part of my life and experience, not only am I gifted, not only am I restored to wholeness, not only am I lit up, not only am I doing the best I could possibly do in producing great results, but I am also an example to the people in my life that it's okay to do that, that it's possible to do that, that it's worth all of the risks, it's worth perhaps not being understood initially, it's worth all of the rewards of doing that. And that in doing this thing for ourselves, we, act, we really do gift the collective. We really do lift up the world. When I'm looking at uh, the word power, the first thing that came up in looking at the word power was reviewing Dr. David Hawkins' book, Power Versus Force. And in the very first chapter, he talks about this malady of humanity not understanding that not only do we have our intellectual thinking minds, but we have our subjective, our subconscious minds. We have not only what we think we're thinking, but everything else. And we also have, he said, the disparity here is that we don't recognize, as, as, as a human race, the connection between our conscious thinking and our subconscious thinking and what happens out there. We don't recognize that there's a relationship, unless you come to a Science of Mind Center or a Unity Church, right, between what we think and what we feel, what we believe, and what shows up in our experience. So he says that people, rather than being empowered in that knowing, they use force to try to deal with everything out there. They try to use force to rearrange what's going on out there because there's no clue that it has something to do with what we think and what we feel and what we believe, that we are participating in the creation of what's out there. And so as you move into this election year, and, you know, and I don't say anything of any bias up here on that note, you recognize perhaps that the relationship between what we think and what we feel and what we believe produces effects and we might just try to run out there and use force to change what's showing up and that won't work. But what will work, what does work, is power. 
because power is a creative power incorporated in each and every one of us. So when we talk about power and light incorporated, when we talk about those gifts and talents not only being gifts for us, but for everyone, we're talking about the power that is life-affirming. It is creative. It is that which focuses on something and activates the law of cause and effect. And we are aware of that. We are aware of our participation in that. We are aware of our part in it. And so we use it consciously. And we use it thoughtfully and carefully. We're talking about being aware of that and being willing to make choices as to how we use that creative power that are good, that are right, that are affirming, and that harm no one. And that evolution of what that means to each of us is, is a personal one that's constantly going on that we call awakening. So we imagine then that our relationship with power is one of awakening. And yes, we do read books and go to workshops. I hope you'll join me this afternoon. We're going to do Power and Light Incorporated. And we're really going to focus on what lights us up and where our power lies and where our gifts and talents are. And we're going to let all the rest go and give ourselves permission to focus on stepping into the new year with those things that empower us with those things that matter most to us. So power, while it may have gotten a bad rap out there, is something in here that we know is truly about creating. It is about life. It is something that is incorporated in every one of us. And the way that we access that power is to discover what lights us up. Shakti Gawain, in her book back in the 80s called Living in the Light, says to just simply follow that feeling of more aliveness and know that that is indicative of a good direction for you. Joseph Campbell coined the phrase, follow your bliss. And so many more ancient teachers and contemporary ones have proven, whether through psychology, philosophy, theology, whether they've proven it through medical science or any other science, they have shown us that it is not only worthwhile to pursue what lights us up, that our health and our well-being, our prosperity, our very survival depends on that. Because the way the universe works is that every time we make a choice that is truly good for us, it is good for all. So when we tap into that level of consciousness and guidance, what we get is a choice that is a win-win, a universal win-win. This is not what my guidance counselor told me. <laughs> maybe, I'll go, I'll, maybe I'll become a science of mind guidance counselor. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we know that now, and we're still here, and we're not done yet. So what lights you up is what makes you feel lighthearted. It's what, you, what makes you feel a lightness of being. In fact, the word light even refers to beingness itself, all oh, of life. So when we say that we are lighthearted, that we feel a lightness of being, that we feel a levity, we are able to laugh why? Because we are in that place where we know, where we understand, where we trust that life wasn't meant to be hard. It wasn't meant to be dark. The contrast, the misery, they're optional. So when we explore what lights us up, we are not just doing a frivolous thing. We are discovering a little bit more about why we're here who we've come here to be, what we have come here to do, how we have come here to live, how we have come here to serve. I just love that my job description is to focus on what lights me up. Because of course, aren't those the things that we do best? Aren't those the things that produce the most excellent results? I know that when I cook food with love, it is more beautiful and delicious than when I cook it in a hurry or, or just because I have to, which I don't really do because I like to do that. 
there are other things, of course, you know, somebody's got to take out the trash, you know. You can do things with love by choice. And up level your experience of the necessities. You can choose to bring a new level of love back into the job that you have and change it from a J-O-B to an L-O-V-E to a ministry to, a, to, to an act of service. Whether it's you know data processing or mopping floors or, or whatever it is because you know what? When we infuse everything we do with love, we light up and we bring light to it. And that triggers awakening. We've spoken many times about this tuning fork concept that when, when a tuning fork that is still and not ringing is right next to one that is struck and begins to ring, what happens without any effort physically whatsoever is that the still one begins to ring also. It's that simple. If you sit next to a person on a bus or a plane or, 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 or wherever, walk next to them in the mall, and you are feeling enlightened and empowered and aware of your divinity and awake, what happens? Something happens in that person. It begins to wake up. You don't have to share a word. That's how easy it is. So rather than frivolous, this idea that we, that we allow ourselves to step into what empowers us, what enlightens us, what restores us to a sense of wholeness and celebration about life is a gift to us and to the world. Deepak Chopra says that if we can ask ourselves what we love to do most, and how we might do that thing in service to others, we will not only be tremendously fulfilled, we will be prospered in a way that we have never experienced it before. It's the same thing, and he calls that Dharma. So we have power, and we have light. And we say that each of these is incorporated in us, meaning that it's built in. What the incorporation part means is that we cannot lose it. We can seem to misplace it like our car keys, but they're somewhere. We can turn away in consciousness from what empowers us and lights us up. And we can feel as if we don't know what that is or that there isn't something for us. Or perhaps that there is an exception to this pattern that is our life and we have to live another one for some reason. But it can never truly be lost. In A Course in Miracles, it says this idea that we could be separated from the truth and the magnificence and the power of who we are is called a tiny mad idea. As in, it's crazy. Because we cannot. We can think that we're separate. We can then feel accordingly. And because a creative process is constantly going on, that beautiful, receptive universe will give us experiences that correlate with that thinking and that feeling and that belief. Have you ever had one of those days where you felt kind of like, I don't know, not much? And, you, and you, you kind of felt invisible and you went to do errands and saw somebody you knew and you're like, and they didn't see you. We literally have times when we emanate this sense of, ah, oh, I don't know, I'm not so much. I'm different. I don't have anything special to offer. You wouldn't want to know me. And then what happens? We experience that. On the other days, when we're up, perhaps we're in love with a person or an idea, or we're just in our zone or on our game, we we'll go out there and we see everybody and everybody sees us and we connect and we have a different experience, right? So it depends on your perspective. So there's power and we know it is power for good. There is power for good in the universe and we can use it, as Ernest Holmes says. There's light, which is that which lights us up. There's the fact that it's incorporated and it cannot be lost. 
There's the fact that when we let ourselves identify what our areas are of these things, we discover our gifts and our talents and our callings. And the other part is that we have this built-in navigation system that will let us know when we're following that or when we're not. There are alarms that go off when we are not following our bliss. It could be as simple as a mood, an emotional state. And of course, if you've taken any of these classes here at a Science of Mind Center or a New Thought Church, you recognize that first comes an idea, a thought, a concept. And then feeling follows and says, okay, yes. <laughs> and then the creative process begins to unfold. And pretty soon our day is going like that. But we can change it. So we have that power, light, incorporated, gifts, and we have a navigation system. We have a navigation system that tells us when we're off course by giving us alarms of moods, of feelings, of experiences. We might stub your toe or run into a curb. You might bump into the car next to you. You might burn your toast or burn your finger. I burn my, I burn my hand trying to get the pizza out of the oven. <laughs> You'll run into walls that have always been right where they've always been, sometimes. You may experience dis-ease. But the beautiful thing is the same inner navigational system will also tell you this when you're on course. It's like a true north. And it's so simple. What makes you feel more alive, what makes you feel more empowered, is the right direction for you. It's a built-in compass. And you can use it in any situation or circumstance. Dr. David Hawkins introduced to many of us the concept of kinesiology, applied kinesiology, for using that method to identify what is right for us and what is not. I've seen it used for everything from chiropractic adjustments to dietary choices to what to read or watch or go do or not do. We know. We know what is right for us. So I invite you as you step into this new year very shortly to give yourself permission to choose that which empowers you. Choose that which lights you up. Choose that which is incorporated and you can't escape it anyway. And choose those things which are your gifts and talents and callings. And let that be your design for living in 2016.